Arab American roots grow deep in Metro Detroit, with immigrants coming here as far back as the 1880s and as recently as this week. Sometimes when one Lebanese person meets another Lebanese person in Dearborn, they say, what village are you from? And, and they might be second or third generation. Absolutely, or fourth, or, or fifth. Fourth I mean, there is there are uh, Arab Americans in metropolitan Detroit that are fifth generation. So it's no accident that Dearborn, Michigan was chosen as the site for the Arab American National Museum. One of the main missions of the museum is to teach about the history and experiences and culture of Arab Americans, especially for uh, people living in the United States who, you know, they, all they hear about Arabs on the news is, is maybe bad things. When they leave here, we want them to see Arabs in the United States as just another uh, group of Americans who have contributed and, and really make a positive impact. Join Digging Detroit host Pete Kalinske as he visits the museum with Dr. Matthew Stifler. There's nothing worse than not having food to offer your guests when they come. And to have a lot of it. And to have a lot of it, yeah, absolutely. Dr. Stifler also shares with us some common misconceptions of the Arab culture. When we tell them that no, we're an ethnic institution, an ethnic museum that represents a very diverse Arab American community, which has lots of Christians, lots of Muslims, there's some Jews, and a lot of secular people. Hi, I'm Pete Kalinske. Welcome back to Digging Detroit. Today we're at the Arab American National Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. I'm here with Matt Stifler. Matt, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. We're going to talk a little bit about the museum, where it came from, why it came to be, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the exhibits, right? Absolutely. Looking forward to it. How long have you been part of the Arab American National Museum? I am the research and content manager here at the museum. I'm also I'm a lecturer at the University of Michigan, both in Ann Arbor and Dearborn where I teach Arab American Studies courses. My main duties here are to oversee the development of our library and archive, to work with curatorial and our education department to make sure that the content that we produce is accurate and reflects the diversity of the Arab American experience. Tell us a little bit about the genesis of the museum. So the Arab American National Museum opened its doors on May 5, 2005. But the history of the museum goes way before that. So the museum is a project of access which is a human services organization founded here in Dearborn in 1971. It was founded by a group of Arab immigrants to serve a mostly Arab American population of recent immigrants coming over from places like Lebanon and Syria and Iraq and Palestine and Yemen. That organization did a lot of immigration help, uh, English as a second language, uh, those kinds of things. And then in 1987, they said, you know what? We really need to educate the greater public about who Arab Americans are, their culture, their history. So they started a cultural arts department at Access. Uh, that cultural arts department is what eventually became the museum. In early 2001 is when they really launched a national Arab American heritage campaign uh, to build the museum and fund a few other programs at Access. Um, as you know, 2001 is kind of like a landmark year when you're talking about Arab Americans because in the fall of 2001, uh, the terrorist attacks uh, on September 11th happened in New York and Pennsylvania and Washington, D.C. Um, and so that, you might have thought, would throw a wrench into the plan to open an Arab American National Museum, considering the backlash that was occurring against Arab Americans, both in the media and uh, through hate crimes and discrimination in the general public. But really, it was that backlash that galvanized our national community and allowed us to um, really fundraise and get people on board by donating artifacts and giving us their stories to open the museum in such a, a quick fashion. You know, one of the major misunderstandings about our museum is that we're a religious institution. A lot of people equate Arabs and Muslims, which is totally not true. There are a lot of Arabs who aren't Muslim and a lot of Muslims who aren't Arab. Right. And so we've actually had people that come here and think that we're a mosque or that we think, that think we're a religious institution, and when we tell them that no, we're an ethnic institution, an ethnic museum that represents a very diverse Arab American community, which has lots of Christians, lots of Muslims, there's some Jews, and a lot of secular people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the misconceptions that we try to, to say is that, you know, we're not a religious institution and not all Arabs are Muslim. Our first permanent exhibit is Coming to America, which tells the immigration story of uh, people coming from Arab countries from the 1800s on up until the present day. And so to populate that exhibit, 
we asked people to give us what they brought with them when they came from their home country. Uh, so it's everything from suitcases to uh, records and cassette tapes and uh, Bibles and Qurans. And, uh, but we also found that since a lot of our population was coming um, as refugees, they were coming fleeing war and fleeing civil conflict in their home countries, that when we asked a lot of people what they brought, a lot of them were kind of ashamed and said, well, we didn't bring anything because we were fleeing our home. And so we actually have a case in the Coming to America exhibit that's empty. Why Dearborn? That's a good question. Most people would think a national museum that's affiliated with the Smithsonian Institution should be in Washington, D.C., or even New York, or maybe L.A. It was clear that the Arab American community in metropolitan Detroit had the highest concentration of Arabs you know, anywhere outside of the Middle East. And so uh, here seemed very natural, not only because this is where the group that it was galvanized to do it, but also because it had such a large, diverse population to draw from. The metropolitan Detroit area actually has many pockets of Arab American communities. So here in East Dearborn, it's predominantly Lebanese, but there's also um, large pockets of Yemenis in the south end of Dearborn, and also Palestinians and Iraqis and Syrians. Um, you go out to the suburbs, you might have a lot of Iraqis up in Macomb County. You also have a lot of Syrian and Lebanese on the east side of Detroit. Uh, you've got a lot of Palestinians in uh, like Livonia, Novi, Northville area. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is quite diverse, you know, all these little mini areas of, of Arabs that live. Um, and, you know, Dearborn tends to be sort of a hub for all of that activity, given, you know, the food that's here and the restaurants right. and the butcher shops and Warren all that Avenue. stuff. And Warren Avenue, yeah. exactly. Why Dearborn? Why, why was there a concentration here? You can trace Dearborn's Arab American history back to Henry Ford and to the Rouge plant down in the South End. Um, but that only gets you so far because there were factories all over the country and Arabs uh, tended to work in factories. They also tended to open stores. They're very entrepreneurial. So what actually made Dearborn what it is today was um, sort of accidents, uh, sort of the fact that um, it happened to be the place that had a large Lebanese population already. And then during the Lebanese Civil War that started in 1975, um, a lot of people started coming here. So the Arab American community in metropolitan Detroit is quite old. We know that uh, as early as the 1880s and 1890s, there were immigrants coming from greater Syria, which at that time um, is, was called greater Syria, but today it's the countries of Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, and Jordan. And we know that they were coming here in the 1880s and 1890s. They were settling mostly in what today is downtown Detroit. Um, we know that because there were some stores um, and restaurants that were popping up on Woodward and along Michigan. Um, and also in the, in the 19-teens, there were two uh, Arab Christian churches that were opened in downtown Detroit. And in 1921, there was a mosque that was opened in Highland Park uh, that was mostly uh, a Lebanese community. So we know that by the 19-teens and early 20s, there were these uh, distinct religious communities popping up, all very much living together. And then um, in the mid-1920s, when Henry Ford moved a lot of his operations to the Rouge factory, a lot of people moved from Highland Park in Detroit into Dearborn, and that sort of was the genesis of what we have today. So anybody that identifies as an Arab American can have heritage back to, that traces their ancestry back to any of the 22 Arab countries that exist both in North Africa and in Western Asia. So you have diversity of climate, you actually have diversity of religion, mm -hmm. um, you have diversity of, of language, of dialect, you have diversity of food and music and all these different traditions. Um, and so when, when those people immigrate to the United States, you know, they kind of get melted into this group right. of Arab American, yeah, which that, could be That's anything. what we do. Yeah. That's what we do. Right. We, we kind of create these big holding, holding pans, yeah, holding pots. Yeah, I think uh, part of what we're trying to do is show that, you know, Arab Americans are so diverse and they can identify in any number of ways. And this museum is a space to capture all of that diversity. We don't speak for Arab Americans, we speak with Arab Americans. And we try to make sure that um, wherever they're coming from, whatever, uh, you know, maybe they were born here, maybe their grandparents were born here, maybe they just immigrated uh, last week. Uh, we want to make sure that this is a place that they feel comfortable coming and sharing their story and actually feeling like they're a part of the Arab American community. That's one thing we like to say about the museum here is it's really, you know, it's about Arab Americans, but it's really also about immigration to America in general. We've had people come in here who are Irish of heritage or Italian or German, and when they go through our exhibits, they, they see themselves and their family in the exhibits and they can say, oh, because we have an exhibit on Ellis Island. Oh, well, my family came through Ellis Island. And, and they sort of relate to that. So we like to say we're not just a, a museum about Arab Americans, but we're really a museum about immigration to the United States as well.
A good example here in Detroit is a lot of people, a lot of the Lebanese people in Dearborn are from a village in Lebanon called Bintijbel. It's in the southern, southern Lebanon. And the story goes, there are now more people in Dearborn from Bintijbel than are left in the village of Bintijbel because of that chain migration. Sometimes when one Lebanese person meets another Lebanese person in Dearborn, they say, what village are you from? And, and they might be second or third generation. Absolutely, or fourth or, or fifth. Fourth. I mean, there's, there are uh, Arab Americans in metropolitan Detroit that are fifth generation. You know, their great, great grandparents came here in the 1880s or 1890s. So we're standing under our dome, which is sort of like our architectural, architectural centerpiece of the museum. Um, the dome is a very common architectural motif throughout the Arab world. Um, it serves a few purposes. You know, I always ask the middle school students when they come in for tours, you know, why do you think we have a dome here? And they say, well, there's domes in, you know, in the Arab countries. And we say, okay, why are there so many domes in Arab countries and what kinds of buildings do you, do you see domes on? And they say, oh, you see them on churches or mosques or, uh, you know, palaces or government buildings. And we say, why is that? You know, there's a few functions of a dome that allows it to serve a purpose on those kinds of buildings. Um, and I always say, you know, I always stick my head under the dome and say, what's the difference if I'm talking over here or talking over here? And they say, oh, it's louder. And I'm like, there you go, natural amplification. So Matt, why, why are we standing in a kitchen? You love to eat, don't you? Well, yeah. Well, yeah, everybody loves to eat. And especially for ethnic groups in the United States, food is a main way that they get to preserve their heritage, mm -hmm. but also a main way that they get to celebrate that heritage with the general public. So I always ask people when they come for a tour, how many people have had hummus? And like, you know, everybody's hand goes up. Mm -hmm. And so we say, okay, that's, that's you're partaking in an Arab American cultural experience. You know, even if that's all you know about Arabs and the Arab world, it's at least a start. Mm -hmm. You know, even 10, 15 years ago, you know, you couldn't walk into Meyer and get eight kinds of hummus. I mean, that's the recent development. And so Arabs take a lot of pride here in the United States that their food, their culture is becoming, you know, more popular. More mainstream. Exactly. Yeah. Do you get any comments from visitors about the tea sets? The hospitality is a very important part of Arab and Arab American culture. It signals to your guests that you want to treat them like family. It doesn't matter who the guest is. You always want to treat people in your home as if they're family. And so coffee and tea allows for that in many different ways. First, uh, when you bring out a hot beverage after a meal, it signals to your guests that you want them to stay, stick around. You know, you can't just chug a hot thing of tea. I mean, you can. You can it's not, yeah, it's not advised. But uh, so you can sit, and even after a long meal, maybe a two-hour meal where you have course after course, uh, the coffee and tea signifies that they want you to stay and hang out for a little bit. Uh, also, you know, coffee cultivated in the way that we drink it today began in, in the country of Yemen. Um, there's a city in Yemen called Mocha. Uh, if you've ever had Arabic coffee, it's it's like espresso, oh, yeah. but it's unfiltered espresso. Right, right. So it's it can it can be very sort of strong, and you don't drink more than maybe an ounce or two of it. No, because then well, you'll be running home. Yeah, then then you're going to be a little wired. What do visitors say about the kitchen layout or the kitchen? Well, if it's an Arab American visitor, one of the first things they say is that's a really small pot. Um, <laughs> And it is. If you go to a, a typical Arab American household, especially one that has a large family or lives in an Arab American neighborhood where they mm -hmm. might expect guests at any time, um, the pots typically take up both burners. Um, and, but that's really part of the hospitality is that when you're cooking, you not only want to have a lot of food for the people that are there, you want to have food in case people show up unannounced. You mm -hmm. never know who's going to stop by, especially if it's around a holiday. So you always want to be prepared. There's nothing worse than not having food to offer your guests when they come. And to have a lot of it. And to have a lot of it, yeah, absolutely. Why is there a wall about Hollywood in the Arab American National Museum? So this is part of our Making an Impact exhibit where we like to showcase how Arab Americans have impacted uh, national culture through arts, through film and television, through politics, journalism, uh, community service, any of those, and science, any of those kinds of things where an you know, immigrant population can really come in and, and use their talents and mm -hmm. make an impact in a meaningful way. And you know, Arab Americans have been very visible in Hollywood for many decades. Uh, probably the most famous people would be Tony Shalhoub, who played Monk. Mm -hmm. He was also on the TV show Wings mm -hmm. uh, in the 80s. Uh, we, uh, you know, Paul Anka is very famous. Even though he's born in Canada, he's an American citizen now, so we'll, we'll count him as an we'll Arab American. Claim him. Yeah, Mustafa Akkad, who did Halloween uh, film. Um, Kathy Najimy, who was uh, popular in the film Hocus Pocus mm -hmm. and Sister Act, and also on King of the Hill. Um, and F. Murray Abraham, who won the Golden Globe for his performance in Amadeus, and is also featured on the Showtime series Homeland now. Okay. Yeah, so there's, you know, as far as academics are concerned, probably the most famous is Edward Said, and he wrote a famous book in the 1970s called Orientalism. 
And that book is quoted by uh, scholars in, in history, and anthropology, and cultural studies. Uh, probably every day in this country, somebody is reading and quoting that book. Uh, we also feature a lot of scientists, uh, like Farouk Elbez, an Egyptian immigrant who helped plan the sites of the Apollo moon landing. Um, so really, uh, Arab Americans have had, have had an impact on our culture through all kinds of different ways, uh, some that you might recognize and some that you might not. Uh, we have Ralph Nader, who was very famous, uh, especially here in, in automobile country, uh, oh, yeah. for the things he did to help improve the safety of automobiles as a consumer advocate. Um, another famous uh, Detroiter is Helen Thomas, who was the first uh, woman in the White House Press Corps and became the Dean of the White House Press Corps for many years. Um, and so we feature Arab Americans that have made all kinds of impacts on our culture. There is a incredibly vital and exciting and dynamic part of American society here. One of the main missions of the museum is to teach about the history and experiences and culture of Arab Americans, especially for uh, people living in the United States who you know, they, all they hear about Arabs on the news is, is maybe bad things. Um, and we want them to come here and say, really, you know, Arab Americans have been very impactful in our culture in, in many different ways, from food to movies to politics to journalism to science. And when, we, when they leave here, we want them to see Arabs in the United States as just another ethnic group, just another uh, group of Americans who have contributed and, and really make a positive impact. Well, I hope whoever sees this takes a look at the museum in a whole different light, a whole different way, and comes by to visit and see what type of common stories there are. Thank you, and we say Ahlan Masahlan, which means welcome and come see us anytime.